is the drink of the common man, a truly global drink with a fascinating story. It's impossible to imagine a part of the world where a beer cannot be enjoyed. Beer has been critical to human civilization. Frank Zappa is famous for saying every country to regard itself as a country needed an airline and it needed a brewery. is the most popular alcoholic drink in the world. 167 countries make over 144 billion litres every year. Around the world it takes many forms, from the golden chilled lagers of Europe to the dark warm ales of England. It began as a domestic brew and became a massive worldwide industry. And now it's come full circle with tiny local breweries competing with giant global brands. The story of beer is the story of civilization. Without beer, people would have been a nomadic race. They would travel from place to place. There was no reason for them to stay anywhere. Brewing emerged thousands of years ago in the Middle East, among the ancient early human settlements of Sumeria, and was almost certainly discovered by complete accident. Somehow, water got mixed with grain, water got mixed with cereal, and someone decided to drink the resulting mush. This mush was the first beer. It's thought that the Sumerians would bake bread and then soak it in water. After a few days, wild yeasts would ferment the brew and an alcoholic drink was created. Beer was incredibly important to early people. The Gilgamesh epic is an ancient oral poem from Babylonia. It tells the story of Enkidu, a savage man who becomes civilized by drinking beer. This there's a very good way of getting back into the minds of people at that time and how people regarded beer when they first came across it. Enkidu ate the bread and drank the ale. It's written that his mood became free, he grew merry and his face lit up. And this must have been a, a completely unique new experience for the first brewers and from that moment they decided they wanted to reproduce that, that experience probably as often as they could. People got together, sat around a pot, and they would take with large straws, drink beer out of a, uh, out of a container. To make beer, people realized they needed easy access to grain. The origins of beer are the origins of farming. Human settlements formed around the crops they grew, the crops they needed for bread and beer. The important things for the early drinkers of beer was it was a source of food, it was a source of sugar which they couldn't have got from anywhere else. Wherever humans settled, the drinking of beer continued and by the time of the ancient Egyptians, beer had been firmly established as an essential part of the daily diet. Their staple diet seemed to consist of beer and onions, which must have made their breath smell awful. Everyone was allowed to have five loaves of bread a day and two glasses of beer a day. It was that important to them. Wine in ancient Egypt was a drink for the elite, but beer was drunk by everyone and archaeologists have found plenty of evidence of its importance. And in every Egyptian tomb that, that people have subsequently discovered, archaeologists have found uh, little models of brewers going about their work and these were supposed to be making beer for the dead person in the afterlife. And, Beer was very important to you in life, and therefore, as far as the Egyptians were concerned, beer must have been just as important in, when you were dead as well. At its most basic, beer is fermented cereal, and as the art of brewing spread around the world, ancient societies would use whatever crop was readily available. In China, wheat was used to make samshu. Russians used rye to make kwas, and in Japan, the most ancient form of brewing used rice.
At the festival, rice was offered to the gods and they received it. Traditionally in Japan, you pour sake for other people and they pour it for you. You do the same today. This way, it is very social. Making rice and sake is done in respect to the gods. It's a social thing. You can enjoy it together. Now it is the same. For example, when drinking beer, you pour it for each other. Sake may be the traditional brew of Japan, but beer made from barley is now the country's most popular drink. This style of beer originates from Europe. Brewing spread from the Middle East through Armenia, Georgia, southern Russia until it reached the famous brewing regions of Bohemia, Germany, Belgium and the British Isles. It was here that beer would become the drink we know and enjoy today. Before we look at how the bready mush of the ancients developed into modern beer, it is important to understand what beer actually is. Beers can be made from any cereal, barley, wheat, corn, rye or rice. It can also be flavoured with anything from hops to herbs, fruit and even chocolate. There are hundreds of different styles of beers in the world, but they are nearly all made from the same four basic ingredients. Water, malted grain, usually barley, hops and yeast. Well, brewing is a fantastic um, combination of craft versus science. We're actually harnessing the natural process of the yeast converting sugars into alcohol. Um, and this was done thousands and thousands of years ago. We've been, as a civilization, drinking beer. The first step in the production of beer is known as malting. The grain used in most beers is barley. This is soaked in water to encourage it to germinate, which breaks down the starches in the grain to create the sugars needed to make beer. The grain is then heated to stop further germination. The drying or kilning of the malt also produces flavours and colours, which will affect the final colour and taste of the beer. You can decide how much you want the barley kilned, and each gives a different flavour. So we, we range from the palest, which probably gives flavours of Horlicks, to a bit further on, ca more caramelisation. That gives you flavours of, of Ovaltine. You carry on a bit more, you get flavours of chocolate, and more again, you get the sort of dry, roasted flavours you get in Guinness. The malt is then ground and mixed with hot water in a process called mashing. This takes about an hour, and during this time, the soluble sugars are released from the malt. The type of water used is also vital to the finished beer and in modern brewing it's strictly controlled. Water, water is the lifeblood to beer and if you get your water wrong then the whole beer falls apart. So these days any brewer of any size will actually make sure that the water, they have an analysis of their water on an ongoing basis to make sure the water doesn't change. After the mashing is completed, the sugary liquid called the wort is run off. The wort is boiled with hops, which flavour the beer and act as a natural preservative. The type of hops used will affect the final taste of the beer, in the same way as different types of grapes are used for different wines. What hops give to beer, they give beer aroma, and they give it flavour. But it also does some more delicate bits that we might not be so aware of. For instance, it um, can improve foam and head retention, so it generally makes the, the beer more appealing and more aesthetically pleasing. The boiled mixture is then cooled and yeast is added in a process known as fermentation. It's at this point that the creation of an alcoholic drink begins. Yeast is a living organism which eats sugars, turning them into alcohol. Just like all the other basic ingredients, the type of yeast added can have a dramatic effect on the final taste and appearance of the beer. Today, brewers very, very carefully look after their yeast. They culture it within their breweries. They have high-tech labs in which they can look after their yeast because they do not want that yeast to change without them knowing. Because that yeast changes, the character of their beer can change. 
Most beer is then fermented for a second time and this creates the fizz. It can take anything from a few days to a few months and even slight changes in time and temperature will affect the finished beer. The beer we drink today is the result of countless tiny variations to a simple process. All beers are made in exactly the same way. But the great differences in taste and texture and colour you get come from the ingredients you use. The different type of cereal you use can give different colour to the beer. The different types of hops you use can give different flavour to the beer. Modern beer drinkers can choose and compare the tastes of hundreds of different styles of beer from all over the world. Probably start off with the Hogarth. Tastings used to be the preserve of drinks like wine and whiskey, but recently there has been a greater appreciation of the complexity of beer. You notice when you pour it out, it, it's very form, very foamy. Mm. Now that is just characteristic of wheat. That's what wheat does. Mm -hmm. it, it is wheat is used by brewers if they want to create a foam. When doing a beer tasting, do you swirl? I mean, what are the things you're looking for initially? You should smell it first. <laughs> because if you taste it, then it destroys your, your, your nose. Yes, and your nose is, the, is your main tasting organ. So this is innocent gun oak aged beer. This is a beer that has been matured in whiskey bottles for 30 days. In terms of ingredients, you know, the raw materials that goes in, this is just hops, barley, yeast and water. Yeah, yeah. The, the oak imparts a lot of vanilla, toffee, honey, sort of citrus mm. flavours that you just don't tend to find in other beers. I think <clears throat> it was brewed to 6.6%, which is, which is potent. And also I think the clarity is absolutely beautiful. The colours, lovely. The final beer is what is known as a stout. It gets its dark colour from the type of malted barley that's used. This is a chocolate stout, so we'd probably assume we're going to get a darker chocolatey head. You'd be surprised how important colour is. If you actually blindfold, say I blindfold my students, and if you blindfold somebody and then keep giving them these drinks, they can't tell the difference between a Guinness and a lager. <laughs> mm. um, if they can't see. You know, in the nose, you really do, you're picking up a very strong roast, mm -hmm. nutty, dark chocolate character. The darkness is, is due to sort of malts, like chocolate malts, which are actually roasted in a drum, like coffee. Actually, it's quite a sweet beer. If you roast malt, you get a sort of a sweeter character. Mm -hmm. If you roast barley, mm -hmm. you get the Guinness character. The drier. So this is a little sweet, yeah. um, whereas the Guinness is a bit drier because they use roasted barley as opposed to this, which is you use roasted malt, which is sweeter. It's a nice rounded mm. flavour too. It's inoffensive, but, but there are there's complexity there, which you certainly go with a lot of dishes. Modern beer drinkers choose from hundreds of different styles of beers with every imaginable flavour and colour. But when it arrived in Northern Europe from the Middle East, it was a cloudy bread soup. How it became the clear, sparkling drink we know today is a fascinating story of happy accidents and dedication. Beer came to Northern Europe over 2,000 years ago. While the wine-drinking Romans saw it as a drink for barbarians, in the cold, wet regions of Northern Europe, beer was an essential source of nourishment. Life was hard, life was tough. People would work long hours in horrible, horrible conditions. It was often said that to do the sorts of job that they had to do, they would have to eat an unfeasible amount of bread. They could get this energy from drinking beer instead. A drink of beer was essential to daily life. It had been boiled, therefore the water had been purified. The people didn't know that the water was purified, but it's what they'd done. Also within beer, it contained so many nutrients and sugars that they couldn't get from anyone else. It was a liquid bread to them. Beer was incredibly important to the early human settlements of Northern Europe. In the Finnish poetic saga, Kalawela, 400 verses are devoted to beer and only 200 to the creation of the earth. But it wasn't the drink we know today. It was cloudy, it could not be stored, and it was also made exclusively by women. Records have shown from 1509 in Aberdeen there were 152 brewers in the area and all of them were women. And the brewing was generally done by the women. It was an extension of the household tasks. Most brewing was done on fairly low level in terms of the amount actually being produced because it wouldn't keep you would brew quite frequently, and it was something that people did. They fitted it in during their chores at home. 
One exception to the small-scale domestic brewing that was being carried out across Europe was in the monasteries. Brewing here began in the 10th century and was on a much larger scale. The monasteries are the origin of many of the world's finest beers. Monks were incredibly powerful people. I think quite often they were also uh, linked very closely to agriculture by being given gifts of farms in the local area. And they were also the supplier, really, of one of the earliest hotel accommodation systems. Pilgrims would travel from country to country seeking religious enlightenment. And it was to monasteries that people would go to stay. It was monasteries that gave people uh, drink and food. And they were not probably unique in the amount of brewing that they did. Any large establishment would consume an incredible amount of ale. If for hundreds of years, the daily ration for most people uh, of beer would be anywhere between six and eight pints a day. This was the, the standard um, monastic allowance for people. Now, they were very clever, the monks. They knew what they were doing, because on days when they had fasting days and they weren't allowed to eat, monks could still have a drink of beer. Monks perfected their brewing techniques and styles using Egyptian records from their monastery libraries. The great legacy we owe to monasteries is the fact that the monks were scholars. They wrote down what they were doing. And to this day, in many parts of Europe, you can find old brewing records that go back six, seven hundred years. Monasteries and nunneries can be credited with the discovery of two major milestones in beer history that would lead to the giant global industry we know today. They created brewing techniques which led to the development of today's most popular style of beer and more importantly, they began to use hops. The addition of hops began a new era. It marked the end of the sweet cloudy beers of the ancient world and the beginning of the bitter, clear beers that we know today. Hops are used to help preserve the beer, but before they were used, brewers would use anything growing in the hedgerow to add to their beer. Bog myrtle was used, heather was used. In fact, if it grew, the likelihood a brewer would try and put it in their beer to see what effect it would have. You hear tales of rats being used, you hear tales of entrails of chickens. You also hear of pine trees, you hear of quassia uh, bark. You hear of um, herbs, lovely herbs being used, heather being used. So anything that came along was used partly to give flavour, but partly to give backbone and partly for preservative. And at that time, you remember, they didn't necessarily know what acted as a preservative, what didn't. Hops were not only found to be an excellent preservative, but they could also be cultivated, providing a constant supply to the brewers. The hop is a tall climbing plant and distantly related to the cannabis plant. Today, many different varieties are grown all around the world. When hops are boiled in the production of beer, they remove a substance that bacteria feed on and so act as a preservative. They also produce a more bitter tasting, clearer drink with a foamy head. Hopped beer took off in Germany and continental Europe, but there were many people who still preferred the unhopped beer, which was known as ale. Resistance was particularly strong in the British Isles. Interestingly, in Shakespeare's plays, every reference to beer is very derogatory. And the one beer drinker who's mentioned is a villain who gets killed off very rapidly. And Shakespeare talks about small beer very dismissively. But he said a, a dish of ale is fit for a king. Shakespeare's resistance to the newfangled hopped beer may have come from a family connection to the unhopped beer industry. His father was an ale conner. It's a job that doesn't exist now, but an ale conner's job was to test the strength of each beer. And he did this by going into a pub at the time. He would ask for some beer to be poured onto the wooden bench, and he would then sit 
on that the beer, the spilt beer, wearing a pair of leather breeches, and it said that the better the beer, the stickier it would be. So that when he stood up, if there was a sound, the beer was good beer. It's a great story, and unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a word of truth in it. And it, if you think about it, it doesn't make sense anyway. Why would somebody ruin their leather trousers, ruin the guy's bench, when if you wanted to test to see whether the beer was any good, all you had to do was drink it? By the 18th century, unhop beer had virtually disappeared. It was a German nun called St Hildegard who first recorded the use of hops, and it's the German religious orders again that can be credited with the next major development of beer. The Munich Oktoberfest, or Beer Festival, is the biggest public festival in the world. Each year, around 6 million visitors drink around 5 million litres of beer and consume over 200,000 pairs of pork sausages. The festival dates back to 1810, when the citizens of Munich celebrated the marriage of Crown Prince Ludwig to Princess Therese. But today it's known for its most famous centrepiece, beer. The heart of the German brewing industry is Munich, originally meaning monk's place. Monks near here accidentally developed a completely new style of beer called lager, which would grow to become the most popular style of beer in the world. In Munich, the brewers uh, got into the habit of storing their beer in caves, cold caves, um, with ice. This storage method led to the accidental development of a completely new form of yeast and a new type of beer, which became known as lager. When stored or lagered in German, the beer became naturally stable. Lager was developed in the early 1800s by Gabriel Sedlmayr, one of the pioneers of commercial brewing. He was a German brewer who in 1840 started to bring technology to his brewery. He brought with him the sacrometer, the thermometer and the steam engine. With the sacrometer he could measure sugar that was in his beer. With the thermometer he could measure its temperature, therefore he could make it more efficiently. And with the steam engine he could start to move heavy materials around his brewery. Sedlmayr's Spaten Brewery still exists today. Its owner was strong on modern technology and on some other tactics. In the early 1800s, he decided on a little industrial espionage and set off with a friend to visit other European brewers. They had hollowed out canes and they would wave these canes over the brew as it was taking place and in front of their guests' eyes, steel yeast and steal the fermenting beer so they could take it back to Germany and experiment with it. The legacy of Gabriel Sedlmayr is that he gave us Munich-style beers. These are beautiful copper, tawny-coloured beers, just with a sort of hint of hops on them. And it was a style of beer that has started to conquer the world. The lager-style beer Sedlmayr produced was dark-coloured, probably unrecognisable to drinkers of lager today. However, it was another German brewer called Joseph Grohl who developed Sedlmayr's techniques to create the first golden lager when he came to the town of Pilsen, now part of the Czech Republic. What he did, and nobody else had ever done before, was to use very, very pale malt. And he produced, to everybody's evident surprise, the first pale Pilsner lager. This new beer was perfectly timed. Glassware was sweeping across Europe and people started to look at what they were drinking. And everyone who wanted to be sophisticated wanted to drink whatever they drank out of a glass. A glass is clear, you can see through it. Up until then, it didn't matter if beer was cloudy, had bits floating in it, because it didn't matter what it looked like. As soon as you put beer into a glass, what it looks like matters. The great thing that happened in the town of Pilsen was that they were able to start brewing a clear, sparkling, beautiful looking beer that just looked magic in a glass. Nobody is too certain why Joseph Grohl did this because the town, the city that he had come from, made a dark lager. Everybody else made dark lagers and he just seems on a whim 
to have decided to produce a very pale beer. This new clear drink became known as Pilsner after the site of its creation and soon its popularity spread right across Europe. Today, over 90% of beer produced worldwide is a golden style lager. Joseph Grohl, in the creation of Pilsner, had given birth to modern beer. Modern beer, though, would always owe a debt to history. A fine example of a, a Pilsner, Pilsen style lager. That's got a nice aroma. Mm. That's, that's a nice hop aroma. One of the characteristic things about this beer, and Pilsner in general, is that it's more hoppy. But this was the first example of a, should we say, a lager, like most people now assume lager is. Yes. And yet, so much more flavour than mm -hmm. most. Mm -hmm. It's probably a bit sweeter than maybe you would expect a lager to be, or maybe you'd be used to. Mm -hmm. um, but that's perfectly balanced, I think, with this lovely aromatic hop character. You know, it's quite lemony, it's quite grapefruity. Chimay is a Belgian beer still made by Trappist monks. You know, I often say to people, never trust anything made by monks or hunters, because <laughs> they've got way too much time on their hands. <laughs> of course, the monks traditionally brewed very strong beers because when they weren't allowed to eat during Lent, the high alcohol beers give them lots of energy, which sustain them during that period. That's my, that's my uh, excuse as well. Yeah, yeah, well definitely. Yeah, let's not advertise. There's a lot of clove in this. Yeah. Well, the phenolic sort of cloviness is coming. That's mm. the, that comes from the yeast, primarily. Yes, it is. It's, uh, it's one probably of a bit of wild yeast. The final beer is based on an old Scottish recipe that, unusually for modern beer, doesn't use any hops. So what are we trying here then, Jeff? Well, we're trying the sort of heather ale, which is a sort of a local Scottish ale in that sense, because of, uh, the heather is a local crop. The hops don't really grow in Scotland. So, you know, you just can't grow them. It's too cold. It has a flowery sort of planty like a plant character. The predominating <coughs> aroma in this for me, and, I, and if you close your eyes and stick your nose in the glass, it's going to be mint choc chip ice cream. Wow, we've had floral mint, mint choc chip now. <laughs> when golden lager was invented in the middle of the 19th century, it swept across Europe. On the western edges of Europe, however, the large-scale consumption of lager would be resisted until the middle of the 20th century. Beers here were an altogether darker affair. Ireland is the land of dry stout, and the most famous is Guinness. The Guinness Brewery was started in 1759 on the site of a disused brewery near an abbey in Dublin. The lease cost £45 per annum, and it was to last for 9,000 years. Thanks to the tenacity of its founder, Arthur Guinness, over 10 million glasses of Guinness are poured around the world every day. By the 1760s, 1770s, his brewery was increasing and he was actually draining off a lot more water than the corporation decided he should have. Um, so the corporation came up and threatened to cut off his water supply completely, which obviously meant that he would have had to stop brewing. So there's a story re recorded in the, the Corporation Minute books of Arthur Guinness going out with a pickaxe and threatening, um, physically threatening and verbally threatening the corporation men um, to leave his water alone or else, and he, he won. <laughs> Today, stout is synonymous with Ireland, but the beer actually comes from England and the city of London. Stout is a shortening of Extra Stout Porter, a beer that became popular among a group of workers in London who were the couriers of their day. And theirs was obviously a very hot, tiring, thirsty job. And outside many pubs in London would be a bench where the porter could put down his load, pop in for a pint of beer. And the beer that they drank was this new, very dark, very bitter beer which became known by the name of the people that drank it, Porter. Porter brewing was on an industrial scale and brewers would compete to brew in bigger and bigger vats. The Muse Brewery was so big that they had, when it opened, over 200 people di dined in white tie and tails in the actual vat in which the beer was about to be housed. We're talking about that big. At the Muse Brewery in central London, the desire to be bigger and better than the rivals was to have disastrous consequences. One of the huge vats burst 
and it contained thousands of thousands of gallons of beer and it flooded you know, many houses uh, in the local neighborhood, drowning scores of people. And so what they did very sensibly is they took the dead and they put them in an upstairs room to actually look after them. But that was too much for the local population who wanted to see this wonderful sight of people who'd been drowned by beer. So they went upstairs and such was the, the quell of people in the room that the floor collapsed and yet more people died. In the 19th century, it would be the Irish brewers who would take over from the English. When Arthur Guinness began, he brewed a variety of beers, but in 1799 he took the brave step of brewing nothing else but porter. I think that Arthur Guinness took a risk when he decided to brew just porter, stout porter, which is a dry, dark, black drink, because the rest of the country at that time was turning to lighter bitters, India pale ales, a totally different style of drink. But he stuck with it, and his family probably still thank him for it this day. While porter began to lose favour in the United Kingdom, stout Irish porter grew and grew and was soon being exported around the world. It's estimated that around 1930, one in ten men in the city of Dublin was either dependent either directly or indirectly um, on Guinness for, its, um, for their wages. You're talking about over nearly 4,000 people working here in the, in the one brewery. So it was highly, highly labour intensive. Um, at the end of each, at the end of each mash, so at the end of each brew, there would have been like a porridge-like substance left at the bottom of all the, the mash vessels. Um, and this would have had to have been dug out by hand. So there was a huge, huge amount of, of labour. Um, they also had three to 400 men working down in the cooperage department as coopers. Um, so that again was highly, highly intensive and, and physical work. One of the perks that it gave to its employees was that um, you got two pints a day. Men would go up and fill up their tankards um, from designated taps around the brewery site and they were allowed two pints a day. Guinness was one of the first global beers and a universally recognised brand. From the 19th century, brewing became increasingly industrial. In this new era of mass production, beer would begin to owe as big a debt to modern science as it did to its heritage. It was a scientist called Louis Pasteur who would make the most important development in beer since hops. Pasteur was a Frenchman from the Jura region of France, um, had a great dislike for the Germans and he wanted to get back at the Germans and the German idea of supremacy. So he uh, came back really from a scientific point of view, showing them how to make good beer. Most people think of Louis Pasteur as pasteurising milk, a boiling milk to drive out all the bugs from it. In fact, his real legacy was it was beer he pasteurised, it was beer that he made safe. Louis Pasteur was the first person to really look at beer under a microscope. He began to examine yeast, and what he discovered would change brewing forever. Up until the 1860s, uh, many uh, scientists still refused to believe that yeast was actually a, a living organism. They, they thought it was a, some sort of chemical that sprang up in beer and was brought about by the changes that went on in fermentation. And it was Louis Pasteur that actually proved that yeast was a living organism. Louis Pasteur's discovery explained the process of fermentation, where yeast turns sugar into alcohol. This meant that for the first time, fermentation could be controlled. In 1871, he was invited to the London brewer Whitbread to look at their beer. In the 19th century, Whitbread was one of London's biggest brewers, but it had a huge, huge problem. Its beers were going off and they didn't know why. The brewers at Whitbread had heard of this man called Louis Pasteur and they had heard of you know, what he might be able to do to their beer, so they invited him to his brewery and the first thing he did was bought a microscope. And over a weekend, he looked at the beers they were producing and found that a lot of them had viruses in, a lot of them were off, a lot of them were going sour. And when the brewers came back on Monday morning, they asked him what he'd found. And he asked them the question, he said, don't you get some of your beers going off? And they said, yes, quite often one in three brews has to be thrown away. And they didn't understand how he could look through the microscope and see this. And he pointed out to them that he could see 
a bacterial infection in the beer. And they immediately at Whitbread the next day went out and bought their own microscope. Pasteur also discovered that flash heating beer killed the bacteria that caused it to go sour. This process became known as pasteurization and production was revolutionized. Without Louis Pasteur, we'd have wild yeast roaming in the country, roaming the breweries. Most of the beers would be sour, most of them wouldn't have longevity, and we'd have a very sad brewing industry. Pasteurization allowed the development of bigger breweries. Beer could now be made consistently and it could be stored. This was the dawn of the new super beers that would threaten to destroy small breweries forever. In America, a businessman called Adolphus Bush was seizing every scientific innovation to create America's first national beer. Adolphus Bush, and like all entrepreneurs, he just started in a very small way. He saw that people wanted beer, so he says, I'm going to become a brewer. And he brewed this light American style beer and called it Budweiser. Bush began to brew on a massive scale and with innovations like refrigerated transport and pasteurization, he was able to sell his beer right across America. Using rice as well as malted barley, he deliberately created a beer with a delicate flavor, designed to be enjoyed by as many people as possible. Adolphus Busch, with his company Anheuser-Busch, had created a blueprint for the commercial beers that would grow to dominate the brewing industry. In their thousands, Americans began to drink this new, milder-tasting beer. Whereas a smaller brewer, bless them, are trying to have big flavour hooks, real intensity of flavour, real difference in flavour, what a bigger brewer is trying to do is to appeal to more people. And therefore, they're trying to take out many of those flavour hooks to make something which is delicate and elegant, but not too many f flavours in it which people could dislike. There was a time when brewers would just brew you know, for their local town. There's a saying in German that you should always drink beer within sight of the brewery chimney. But the modern world has changed all of that. At the end of the 19th century, while super beers were developing in the West, there was a whole market in the East where beer was still relatively unknown. But this was all about to change. Japan is one of the planet's oldest brewing nations and until recently its most popular alcoholic drink was sake, an ancient drink brewed from rice. In just over 100 years, however, it is now beer. Fred Kaufman has been running a bar in Japan for 25 years and has witnessed the rise of beer firsthand. When I started 25 years ago, we only had 15 types of imported beer, and now we have over 300. When I first got to Japan, um, it was basically sake, but um, I think now beer is really the national drink. Fred's bar is in Sapporo, the home of Japanese beer. It was here in 1876 that a group of Japanese businessmen decided to set up Japan's first brewery. But with no beer-making history of their own, they looked to Germany for inspiration. It began in 1876, originally pioneered from Tokyo. A number of people came to construct a beer factory in Sapporo. In those days, Nakagawa Saibi, who was pioneering this work, had been to Germany for a number of years, studying the techniques of how to make beer. Sebi studied at brewery school in Berlin. There he learned to make the golden lager style beer that was rapidly becoming the beer of choice around the world. It must have been an incredible journey for him. He travelled thousands of miles by sail. He was in a strange country, hardly spoke the language, probably didn't speak very much more than a few words. Had to learn about something that was completely alien to him. And then come back and everybody would be staring at him as the man that was going to introduce this, this new industry to their country. The Japanese people thought beer tasted like medicine and they really didn't want to drink it. 
And um, back then, it was basically for export to the foreign community in Yokohama. So a few years after that, they started the Sapporo Beer Club. And what it was is once a month, um, all the captains of industry would get together and force themselves to drink that horrible bitter beer. But it, it, it was a way to promote the local economy. And it must have worked because now everybody loves beer. In Japan, young people love beer. There are lots of places to drink it. Although there are a lot of people that still drink sake, when drinking beer, we make a lot of noise, which Japanese young people love. We love beer. It's more social. Every day when I'm finished work, I come home and I like to drink a beer first. I don't feel like my day is done unless I have a beer. 30 years ago, beer wasn't a drink that women had. It was a man's drink. Now, of course, women can also drink it, and it's delicious. Nothing is better than this. Japan is typical of many Asian countries that have created domestic beer industries in the last 100 years. Despite the success of Japanese brewing, however, the most popular beers in Japan are imported. After thousands of years of history, the big brewers were in danger of turning beer into a mass-produced fizzy drink with little more variety than styles of cola. They're buying up breweries in China, they're buying up breweries in South America, they're buying up breweries in Eastern Europe because they want to turn beer into a commodity. Beer lovers around the world began to worry about the dominance of the big breweries. Beer was in danger of losing its unique identity, and they decided the only answer was to start making their own. This is a, a Heineken. They have breweries all over the world. For the tastes of beer drinkers, though, the small brewers face stiff competition from the big international beers. The texture, very light, very refreshing. That's right. It's the sort of beer that sucks you in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. You could really have a few pints of this. That's right. The malt and hop uh, aroma is fairly well balanced. I don't think there's anyone dominating here no. at all. There's nothing not to like about mm. this beer. But there's also nothing to rave about. <laughs> you know, you're not going to love this beer. You're not going to hate it. But it's not going to be your favourite beer. You in know, the world. I disagree. I think you could love this beer. Really? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Well, well if, if they're the third or fourth biggest brewer in the world, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily. Yeah, four four of the biggest car maker, but I don't love uh, their cars. Uh, but uh, other people do. But a lot of people do. <laughs> So let's move from the, the mega brewers <laughs> down to the micro breweries, I suppose. Uh, let's try this one first. And let's try the Eye of the Hawk. Okay. Appealing name, if nothing else. The Eye of the Hawk is from the Mendocino Brewery in California, one of America's first microbreweries. The smell I get from the first nosing is exactly how I remember American microbrews yep. in terms of hops, yeast. It, it, it's a little bit hazy, um, and the trouble is if you start using a lot of malt, and a lot of yeast, then you end up like this, you know. But it's nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a beer that you you take in in moderate quantities, and it, the brewers made it in that in mind. It, it's it's going back. It's the way the way beers used to be. So we've got Dead Guy Ale from the Rogue Brewery in the United States. The Rogue Brewery was set up by one of the founders of Nike. For me, it's got a lot of lychee character. This one, it's quite a sort of almost a chewy aroma. These brewers are almost evangelical about the, their products, what they're doing and how they're doing it. It's almost impossible being in a room with these guys not to feel enthusiastic about, about brewing. Over the last 30 years, a new chapter has begun in beer's rich history. If it was America that created one of the first industrial brewers, it was America again that would spearhead a quiet revolution in beer, a series of tiny breweries in Northern California. The first one was set up by Jack McAuliffe in 1976. McAuliffe had been serving at a naval base in Scotland, where he had discovered traditional British-style beers. When he returned, he found the only beer available in bars was the mass-produced American lager made by the big breweries. He decided Americans were missing out. Don Barkley, then fresh from brewing college, remembers how it all started. Oh man, I'll tell you, in the early days of the New Albion Brewery Company, we had a great time. It was very unique. The large brewers, they say, what? What are you doing? That's impossible. How, how do you expect to take on Anheuser-Busch or Miller or Coors? And we told them we were making a unique beer, something different, something just for our own locale. 
In 1976, there were only 16 breweries in America. The new Albion Brewery was America's first new microbrewery, and beer lovers watched with interest. I don't think that when we first started that we ever realized the way that the microbrewery brewery movement would explode onto the scene. We knew that we could make a good product, we knew that people would enjoy it, but boy, we didn't realize that it would go to the spot that it is now. New Albion Brewery became the Mendocino Brewing Company and inspired a whole new generation of microbreweries across America who would change the world of beer forever. They put in more hops than a European brewer would use. They try and use barley and other malts in a different way than a European brewer would use. They, and as a result of that, we have now got all these exciting, wonderful tastes of beers. Now, uh, with the explosion of microbreweries, there are literally thousands and thousands of breweries in the United States. And what a great thing that is. Now we can stop at our local pub, where it, uh, whatever, wherever it is in the United States, and have a fine beer. In Europe, localized brewing had been in decline. The microbrewery movement in America gives specialty beers a name all over the world. So even a tiny brewery could find a huge market and make money. Even in the remotest regions of Europe, like the Isle of Skye in Scotland, tiny breweries have opened up that are serving not just the local community, but the whole world. We're almost going back to the situation we were in many, many years ago, where every locality would have its own small brewery that would just serve that area. Uh, of course, these days, with better transport links, small breweries can now supply the, the products uh, nationwide and, and even overseas, uh, which couldn't be done in the past. Quite often, the breweries in the early days only had one, two, three, four, five people in, and that is almost still the same today. But it's in, in incredibly powerful because it is linking more and more local people with the local farmers, the local people with the local brewery, and actually allowing it to be seen as a local food resource and linking in with local food suppliers as well. We as humans uh, have a community spirit and we want to take pride in our community and in our neighborhood. And so the microbrewery movement, part of its legacy is bringing people back into the community and have, taking pride in their local community. The rise in the number of breweries has also meant that today there are more beer styles available than ever before. There are brewers who are going out and looking for new recipes, new ways of doing things, new tastes, new styles. But at the same time too, there are brewers who are going back into the history books and finding out how beer might be brewed 100 years ago, 200 years ago. There are more and more breweries around uh, producing very good beers. Um, some of them are using older recipes, some are devising new recipes, some are bringing in ideas from the continent. So now as a customer you have an opportunity for that spectrum of flavors and uh, that's probably singly the most important thing about the microbrewery movement is it's opened up people's palate. In 8,000 years, humans have changed from hunter-gatherers to civilized people with rich cultures. Beer was there right at the beginning and has traveled full circle through industrialization back to its local roots. Whatever the next 8,000 years bring, we can be pretty sure that beer will continue to be an important feature of life. A world without beer would be a very, very dull place indeed. It would be a world without laughter. It would be a world without good conversation. And it would be a world without companionship. I can't imagine a world without beer. It would be a bland place. A world without beer would be a very, very sad place to be. I think beer is the mother's milk of humanity.